My name is Paula Levesque. Our scripture this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. And I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. Thank you for braving the weather. And um, last week we had even more weather, so that's why today we thought it important to bring back what we had planned last week, which is this service of baptismal reaffirmation. Christian tradition is that about the second Sunday of January, after epiphany we remember that jesus was baptized and we find our own identity in baptism as well so that's what we're focusing on today let us pray holy god thank you for creating us giving us life and through our baptism giving us new life in jesus christ touch us in this hour by the power of your holy spirit to make us people who are fit for the journey of serving Christ for the rest of our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So when we're going out in public, who needs a bath? Think about that. You need to be cleaned up, right, to present yourself the best you can. I've got a little picture of my kids when they needed a bath. This was when my son was an undergraduate at Virginia Tech, and there was a 5K mud run coming up, and he called his sister, who wanted to come along with him and join in the fun. If you've never met my kids, to me, this is the essence of who they are. They are all in. My son said they they ran the 5K, and he said, I came to the end, and I hadn't really seen any mud, and they had just kind of dug a little pit about five feet wide, about ten feet long, and you really had to make an effort to get into it, so in I went. And of course, his sister went right with him. I suppose just about every parent has some story or photo like this of their children just digging all in into all that life and the earth has to offer. Some of them even have numbers, you know, the kind of story your mother just tells over and over about you. The one my mother always told on me was when I was about two years old. My father was a pastor, and we lived in a parsonage. This one was in Glen Allen, Virginia, before there was the short pump town center and all that stuff. It was when Glen Allen was really just kind of a backwater. And behind the garage, they had dug up a garden plot. And it was spring, and it had been raining for about a week. So I had two brothers. So what did three boys do when there's a lot of mud behind the garage, right? We went and we played. But I was very young. And so when my mother called everybody in for dinner, my brothers came, but I didn't. And she turned to my brothers and said, where's Kirk? Well, he was right there behind the garage, I don't know. So she called again. And then she did, as mothers often do, and used all three names. Gary, Kirk, Nate. I still didn't come. So now she's in a huff. And she looks around behind the garage, and there I am, stuck in the mud. I literally could not move. She said she reached out with both arms and pulled. And there was that sucking sound, you know. (laughs) Out I came. The shoes didn't, but out I came. To this day, some archaeologist in Glen Allen, 100 years from now, is going to recover some child's shoes behind a garage. 
She said she walked into the house, both arms extended because I was just so, such a mess, plopped me down into the bathtub, fully clothed, pulled the shower curtain, and turned the water on. I needed a bath. Today we're focusing on baptism, which is the bath or shower of our souls, where we get clean, you know? Think about when you were really dirty, maybe just an outdoor job where you just worked all day and the perspiration mixed with all the dust and it got under your skin and just, you couldn't wait to get a bath. So you took one and you come out and what's the expression? I feel like a whole new person, a whole new identity. And that's what God is doing with us in baptism, making us clean, washing away all the stuff of our past so we can step up in a whole new identity. Have you noticed that's where Jesus' story really starts in the Gospels? Luke gives us the manger story. Matthew gives us the story of the three kings. But they really don't get into who Jesus is until his baptism. Mark, in fact, starts with the baptism in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Because this is where Jesus' ministry, this is where the journey really begins. There are far too many Christians in the world who think Christianity is all about getting saved. You know, profess your faith in Jesus Christ, get, get baptized, and then sit around and wait for your death, you know, so we can all go to heaven. No. This is where Jesus' story begins, not ends. This is where our story begins, not ends. Our baptism is the beginning of a long, wonderful journey with God in Jesus Christ. And so today we have this text from Isaiah 43. Judah needs a bath. This is Isaiah the prophet speaking to Judah, the, king, the southern kingdom that surrounds Jerusalem. The backstory is that Judah has misbehaved. They have worshipped other gods along with the one true God, Yahweh. The prophets have spoken to them and Judah wouldn't listen. So finally the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and took them all off into exile, into slavery. The prophet's interpretation of all this is this is God's discipline. God is teaching them something new. Any child that's been disciplined by a parent, you know, there's this feeling like the parent doesn't love me anymore, or at least that raises a question. And so we get this good news today from verse 1. Now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Focus on that word redeem, redemption. You know what that's like, right? Anything that's gone bad, gone sour, it's corrupt, it's ruined, somehow, someway it is restored. God is saying, Judah, I'm restoring you. You may have felt separated from me while you were in exile, but no, no. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You belong to me. Those of you who've been to parenthood up to the point where I have, I've reached that point where the kids, you know, are away. You spend years with children, and you raise them the very best you can, and they they tolerate their parents as much as possible. But there's this place where they're independent, and they're free, and you let them go, and that's what you raise them for. But there's that point of risk where they may go out and act like anybody's children but yours. They still carry your last name. This is kind of where God is with, with Judah. I've called you by name. You are mine. It may have felt like discipline. It may have felt like we were separated. But no, no, you still carry my last name. You're still my children. I was disciplining you so that I could redeem you, make you clean, give you a bath, and you could come up with this new identity. Because after all, as it says in in verse 5, God is saying, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east. He's saying, I'm going to bring you back from the exile. From the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. They will return from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God created Israel. God created Judah for God's glory to show to the world what it's like to live with God even though they messed up. This is still their purpose. Even though you and I have messed up, this is still our purpose. We are to display the glory of God and nothing less. 
I don't know about you, but I think about trying to do that to display God's glory. Who am I? I need a bath. I need to be cleaned up before I can do that. But that's the purpose for which we were created. So God in baptism washes us and sets us on a whole new journey, gives us a ministry to perform. I love what Bishop Will Willimon once said about baptism. He said, when you think about baptism, baptism means what water means. When you think about the different characteristics and purposes of water, you can very often tie that into your baptism. There is no life without water, right? You can go for quite a long time without food, but you can't go very long without water. Water is essential to life. Try and not, you know, water that plant in your house over the winter. You will watch it, you know, dry up and decay. There's no life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. There is no life, real life, without God. It is essential. Baptism means what water means. Water means life. Water, of course, as we said, means cleaning. It means washing off all the dirt, all the stuff of our past. Let it go down the drain. Don't bring it back. Water means cleaning. But there's another aspect of water that we sometimes neglect, I should say. There's a destructive characteristic in water. We see that in floods and hurricanes. We see that in the story of Noah and the flood where God says, this creation is messed up. Let's just wipe the slate clean and start all over over again. Let's destroy it. That aspect is a piece of our baptism as well. St. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, for this purpose, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You can't take on new life until you say goodbye to the old one. You can't can't take on this this journey of living to the glory of God if you're still carrying all the dirt of your past. Baptism means death and new life. So you and I take on a whole new identity. Remember, when Jesus was baptized, that voice came from heaven and said, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We get a whole new identity. As God said to Judah, I have called you by name. You are mine. This is your essential identity. That says something powerful, friends. First thing it says for me is, I am not insignificant. Okay, all you English teachers, I know that's a double negative, but there's a point to this. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I feel insignificant on this planet, particularly when I drive into Northern Virginia. There's just so many people, you know? People of all kinds, all shapes, you know, and there's just so many, and I know God loves every single one of us, so how is it, God, that I am somehow significant? Do I need to be like Jeff Bezos, you know, and make something of myself before everybody's going to take notice and remember me when I die? No, God says that's not the basis of your significance. The basis of your significance is found in verse 4 of this text, because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you there's those three little words directly from the mouth of God to you and me I love you that is the basis of your significance not what you accomplish not what you've done or left undone the basis of your significance on this planet is God loves you do you understand that can you grasp that If you're like me, there's times where I grasp it and there's times I forget it and I try and make something of myself and think I've got to accomplish something. But no, that's not it. God just loves us like a good parent would love a child. Not because of what they've done or left undone, but simply because the parent just loves. And it says, God says, I have called you by name. There's an identity that is unique and specific. I know you, God says. I created you. I formed you, O Jacob. I know you better than, I know, than you know yourself. In other words, God doesn't just know all the stuff we've done. 
Even the stuff we keep secret from everybody else, maybe even try to keep secret from ourselves and deny it. God knows not only what we've done, God knows why we did it. God knows our whole story, our whole DNA. The stuff our parents did to us. The stuff our friends did to us. The scars we have accumulated along the way. The, way, the reason we reacted the way we did last Thursday. God knows the whole thing better than we do. I have called you by name. I know you. And God gives us a purpose. Meaning for life. We are created for the glory of God, it says. Do you understand that? Our baptism is the beginning of the journey to fulfill our purpose in the world. A pastor named Maxie Dunham, an old United Methodist pastor, he's retired, I think he's still alive. He, he used to say, there are people in this world who are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. You know? So focused on heaven and the reward that may come later on, you know, or was promised to me in Jesus Christ later on, but not focused on the here and now, when our neighbor is hungry, right? When people are hurting, when people need prayer, when people need love. Some folks are so focused on their own reward that comes much later, they are no good today. This is the reason you and I are created, friends, to share God's glory here and now, to share Christ's love here and now. And it begins with our baptism. So I, today I want you to take a little emotional exercise with me, a little emotional reminiscence. Do you remember your baptism? If you're like me, you were an infant when you were baptized. So I don't literally remember it, but I've heard the stories about it so much that I kind of I know what happened. So the first picture I'd like to show you is the church where it happened. And as I think about this, I want you to think about where you were baptized. Do you hear this? This is all about me. It's, I want us all to go together on this journey. So I was baptized. This is Grace. Back then it was called Grace Methodist Church. It was before the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodists came together and formed the United Methodist Church. It was Grace Methodist Church on Williamson Road in Roanoke, Virginia. Anybody that lives in the valley, you understand. Route 11 runs through the whole thing. It's right on Route 11, Williamson Road in Roanoke. My father was the pastor. Well, educational wing on the back was being dedicated on the day that I was baptized. So, now I want you to think about who was the pastor that baptized you. I went back in the, in the archives and I found pictures of the people who were there. Not just my father, but our district superintendent, who was Dr. Carol Freeman on the left. He's the one that baptized me. And because it was a celebration of the church, we were dedicating an educational wing. My father had, had, had invited Bishop Garber, the person on the right. So he was there. And the district superintendent was the one who did it. Now, here's the story my mother tells about this. There I was in my white dress. You know, all the guys go snickering. Yeah, there was this baptismal gown that was shared in the family, you know, generation by generation. And so there I was in my dress, all of about four months old. And a lady on the pew with my mother said, oh, is, your, is one of your children being baptized? Yes. Oh, we've just gotten back from the Holy Land. I've got holy water from Jerusalem right here in my purse from the Jordan River. Don't you want to use holy water to baptize your child? And my mother just, whenever she told the story, said, I just didn't want to get into that discussion. You know? Because is, is it more special than water out of the Shenandoah? No. Right? But there's a little extra symbolism, maybe. So I was baptized with holy water from the Jordan River by our district superintendent with a bishop of the conference there. So what is the significance of all of that? beyond your baptism nothing not one thing because who did it where it happened these are all things that are great to remember is this is the beginning of our journey but what we do or what the pastor does doesn't mean a thing it's all about what God is doing with the symbol of water invisibly in ways that you and I are not aware of in that moment but will become revealed to us over time God begins that journey with baptism, washes us clean so that we can fulfill the purpose that God has given to us, answer the call that Christ is giving to us. And it's all symbolized in this water. Never underestimate this power. Because, friends, if you want to know what the end product of the church is, why we're doing what we do, it is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We do that initially with baptism. Did you know 
that last year 28 people professed their faith in Jesus Christ in this church. 28 people. 10 of them were confirmand, young people. For the first time in their life, they were professing their faith in Jesus Christ. Some of them were adults. Some of them were reaffirming their faith in Jesus Christ after a long hiatus of no activity in the Christian faith. But 28 people profess Jesus. This is what we do here, friends. Never underestimate its power because each one of those baptisms or professions or reaffirmations of faith, each one of those is a story of God's redemption in one person's life. And that's powerful stuff. And I remember when I think about the power, I remember a young adult just a few years ago here in this church. And I didn't know what was going on in her life. I knew that she had recently graduated from college. I, you know, it was kind of, I knew that she was kind of taking on faith in a, in a new way as she stepped out, you know, from the for independence from her home. And she was taking on a commitment to Jesus Christ. And But I didn't realize it. I didn't take all that in until she knelt in front of us and we put water on her head in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the tears just streamed down her face. Tears of joy, tears of relief. She was taking a bath, right? On the inside. That's what we do here. And that's what this day is about. In a few minutes, we're going to have the opportunity to reaffirm our baptism in Jesus Christ. I want to be a little, little careful in that we are not renewing, I mean, we are not rebaptizing people. We're renewing our side of the covenant. Baptism is something that God does. So to rebaptize would be to say somehow God didn't get it right the first time, or God didn't have the power to do it the first time. No, this is more like our friend John Wesley, who founded Methodism, who says, We have the power to send away our baptisms. In other words, if this covenant gets broken or stretched, it's not God's fault, it's ours. So today is about renewing our side of the covenant, so we are going to have the opportunity to take those vows of baptism again and then remember where our journey began and remember the path that we are on, fulfilling our purpose of loving others. And if you're afraid of this journey, hear again what God says. Do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Let us pray. Thank you, Almighty God, for never giving up on us, for creating us and claiming us on as your own and working with us all through life's journey. We come this day to renew our side of the covenant, to renew our vows, to take a bath, to step from the tub clean and fit and worthy of being called your children. As we seek to live out our purpose of Christ's love in our lives, we offer our prayers this morning on behalf of those who need your special touch. We pray for Clifford Hebert. We pray for Harold Ogg. We pray for the people of Wetumpka, Alabama, who are suffering from a tornado. We pray for the family of Joyce Kane and the family of Bruce Dawson. We pray for Christians anywhere who are persecuted. We pray for the family of Valora Heiberg. We pray for Bob Hall. We pray for Frank Shader, for Lee Bopp, for the family of Kitty Shendo, for Robbie Robinson, for Sheila Baker, for Denny Bromley, for the family of Senator Quayle. We pray for Harold Madigan, for George Morris, for George Quarles, for Joyce Braithwaite's family, for Ed Orndorff, for Ann Kellican, for Dick Harmison, for Brian Barnett, and others that we name in our hearts. And we pray, Almighty God, for wherever there is brokenness and people in need. We, we pray for those who are homeless, for those who don't have jobs. We pray for our nation's troops and their families. We pray for peace in every corner of the globe. We pray for those who've suffered from fires in California. We pray for our nation's federal workers. We pray, O Lord, that you will be with them in the uncertainty. And through all of this hurting, Lord, we ask that you call us again as Braddock Street United Methodist Church to share Christ's love and to bring healing in the world. These prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 